Okay, well, I'm excited to be here and I'm excited to uh, announce that we're having a virtual round, uh, round table of the future leaders here uh, at the Realtor Land Institute. Uh, our goal today is to, to talk with uh, experts in their area and uh, throughout uh, the United States here about uh, landowners. It's a what landowners need to know COVID-19 in the land market. Uh, and this is sponsored by uh, RLI's 2020 Future Leaders Committee that has lined up a panel of experts from across the country in various different land markets to shed some light on the impacts of the COVID-19 outbreak on land values and the land market trends. We are going to start off today in a question and answer format with an expert accredited land consultant or ALC from each land segment sharing their insights. It is important for our listeners to know that in many cases, it is still too early to know these exact impacts we will see on the market, but we hope to share some guidance for, their un for this unprecedented time. Opinions and advice expressed in this session are not necessarily endorsed by the Realtors Land Institute and information should not be construed as recommendations for any course of action regarding financial, legal, investment, real estate, or accounting matters without further consultation about your unique circumstances by a land expert in your market. To find a land expert in your market, please visit rliland.com to access their Find a Land Consultant tool. So let's get started, guys. Uh, thank you, everybody that's uh, joined in with us today. Uh, we've got a great panel. Uh, we're going to start off with Matt Davis. He's an accredited land consultant from San Diego, California. Uh, he is with Cushman and Wakefield. Uh, Matt's going to talk a little bit about development and commercial land. Matt, thank, thank you. Look forward to the opportunity. Yeah. Okay, Matt. Uh, Matt, thanks for joining in with us. Uh, you know, our first question is, how has the COVID-19 impacted commercial and urban infill de development opportunities? Uh, those are opportunities that we would typically describe as being vacant pads or lots or redevelopment of previously developed parcels that are located in an urbanized area. And uh, this is a development project that would have a less cumbersome entitlement and permitting process. So it usually can be completed in the more near or midterm timeframe. Because these projects have more near term completion dates they're more susceptible and more impacted by current economic uh, changes in the environment. So we are uh, absolutely seeing uh, COVID-19 impact these types of projects. And um, we anticipate, you know, there'll be lasting impacts from COVID, but due to uncertainty surrounding how long the shutdown will last, how deep the economic impacts will be, and how long the recovery will take. Most developers, investors, and lenders we're talking with don't know how to underwrite the risk. So said another way, they, they don't know how much of a discount is reasonable. And so that rather than make a mistake, they've simply put their pencils down and they're on the sidelines. There are buyers that are still underwriting deals. Um, the ones we've talked with have been using more conservative assumptions some of those have been slower lease absorption for new construction, um, no rent growth over the next couple of years, and in increased cap rates at their exit. Uh, again, those are all conservative assumptions that will result in a, a lower land value than there would have been a month ago. Um, for these types of projects, we've been advising our clients that it, it's a great time to put together marketing collateral and be prepared to enter the market as soon as there's an anchoring event that lets the market know that we bottomed out and the recovery has begun, at which point the appropriate discount is likely to become a bit more clear. And mm -hmm. uh, we can be prepared to accept, or uh, alternatively, uh, they can be prepared to accept a, a substantial discount now from buyers who will likely view these properties less as near-term projects and more of a long-term hold for future development. So it's, it's not, uh, not a great time to be trying to sell projects that have near-term development potential, unless there's a unique case. There's certainly users out there that are still very active and need, land, need new uh, news. And so it's really case by case, but you know, on the whole, that's the, the feedback we received. Also, Matt, uh, could you tell us a little bit about how COVID-19 has impacted transitional land and master planning and development opportunities? 
for transitional master plans, we've seen very different impacts. These are projects that take many years to complete entitlements and permitting, so they're less likely to be impacted in the short term or by any sort of near-term economic disruption. Uh, for these projects, uh, again, the only real issue we've seen has been delays during due diligence. Uh, it's, it's been difficult to coordinate meetings with municipalities, with project consultants, um, and, and other vendors that are involved in, in uh, kind of doing your homework at the front end of the project. So on a case-by-case -case basis, we've been you know, looking at extensions where, where appropriate during due diligence, uh, just to allow the buyers time to do reasonable investigations. Otherwise, our, our guidance on these projects has been move forward at full speed. Uh, we've done a couple call for offers during the last few weeks and uh, second rounds of offers and haven't seen prices change at all from where they were, where the bids were coming in prior to uh, the shutdown. So good, good news on the longer term development front. Uh, Matt, how, how have you seen, uh, you know, like you were discussing about due diligence, have you seen uh, your buyers and even the, the, the clients that you work with utilizing new innovative ways to get out there and still conduct business, uh, even in the midst of uh, kind of keeping our distance? Certainly, um, video conference is, is a lot more common than it used to be. Um, where we've seen challenges has been getting site visits set up again with with municipalities or the engineer or somebody like that um it, it seems like it's it's 50 50. some will go to a site by themselves and visit it some won't they're just staying at home so um on the due diligence side and just you know municipalities being more open to video conferencing and things like that we we haven't seen a ton of changes at this point gotcha okay okay well, we appreciate you a lot. Uh, any final thoughts or anything that uh, specifically uh, in your area that you'd like to add or, or talk about? I think that covers it on the, the more development related parcels. Okay, well, great, Matt. We really appreciate you taking the time to, to take some time out of your day and let us know a little bit of what's going on with development and commercial land in, in San Diego. Uh, thank you for doing that. We really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and turn it over to our next uh, panelist to talk a little bit about agricultural ranch land. Uh, we've got Clayton Pilgrim. He's an accredited land consultant with Century 21 Harvey Properties, and he's located in Paris, Texas. Clayton, thanks for coming on with us. Absolutely, absolutely, and, and pleasure to do it. Yeah, we, we really appreciate it. And uh, how's the weather in, in Paris, Texas right now? We, we're, we're as wet as we've been probably in the last 50 years. We're, we're, uh, we're, everything's muddy and uh, we're hoping for some drier weather to get some stuff planted and get some relief to the cattle and uh, all the farm and ranch and, and the whole community is kind of wore out with the weather lately, but uh, we'll probably dry out and it'll be a drought before the end of the, end of the summer, so. Yeah, feast or famine. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, uh, Clayton, we got a couple of questions for you and uh, excited to hear what's going on in the, in the Paris area and in regards to agricultural ranch land. Uh, what has COVID-19 done to the demand for beef and what will this pandemic do for future production? So, and, and the NCBA put a great article out today. I tell any producer or, or consumer or anybody looking in this, in this particular sector of the business, but, uh, beef demand is 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 pretty weak uh a lot of people think because you know the grocery stores are empty that a lot of the beef demand is is or the beef demand's higher but not necessarily because uh a lot of our restaurants shutting down has has really really put up a, a huge hurt outback and chilies and all your big chain restaurants uh that you frequent all the time or even your really high-end steak restaurants and things everybody shut down they are doing, uh, there is some demand, but I'm going to say we're probably 10% off of where we were last year. NCBA, uh, which is the a really good number, they, they put out some really good survey numbers. Uh, and I'm reading these directly off the article that I've that uh, was sent to me this morning, but some, some direct numbers. Cow-calf guys are looking at $111 loss, a cow. Uh, stalker guys are looking at about 160 bucks. And then people that are that are sending cattle to the feed yard are looking at about a two hundred dollar a head loss. Um, our local feeder market, in my opinion, that is 
probably a, a good staple for the whole United States as far as uh, central and also produces the most head every week to sell to the feeder market is, is Oklahoma City. Past few weeks, uh, they've had about a 1,200 head run a week. That's difference of 10,000 head. Uh, usually they're in the 10 to 12,000 head per week, cap, you know, cap. And then uh, people are pulling cattle back. Uh, we've had some price adjustment. So uh, people are pulling stuff back to try to keep them on uh, as long as they can until the prices go back up. In my opinion, uh, that's going to cause us even to go further down. Uh, reason being is, is, is placements are down. And they're shutting some plants down due to the COVID-19 outbreak. Some of the packer plants, including pork and chicken, those, in my opinion, are definitely shut down because of the virus, but they're also kind of a relief to some of these larger producing companies such as Cargill and JBS because uh, they, need, they need a little bit of a break on it because consumption's down. Uh, beef consumption went up in 2019. It's gone up since 2014. They've gotten a little bit of the market from the poultry guys. Uh, that's a good positive uh, effect. We had a really good export market the last 12 months since they've, they've replaced some of that Japan and Asian market that we didn't have before when we were kind of battling out on some of that stuff. Uh, demand, demand could go back up. It's just, it's, I think we're going to be in about a six month to maybe a year glut. We're going to see a lot of beef go to the freezer. We're going to see a lot of beef sit, uh, there's going to be some, uh, you know, when you look at it on the seed stock side, I think you're, uh, you're going to see a lot of heifers get slaughtered this year because of price. People are not going to be able to retain their heifers for breed back and then going in for their uh, replacements on their cattle. Uh, that would cause a little bit of a herd shrinkage. And also, if you look in the coal market, what I'm saying is, is a killer cow, a cow that won't breed back or she's, you know, out of her window of production, she's going, uh, she's gone already. And then uh, the one that was probably not ready to go for another two or three years, she's going as well. And so you're seeing a lot of herd call back. And I think, you know, a big thing that people um, don't understand is the, you know, it's just like the milk business. They're, they're pouring milk out. The reason they're pouring milk out is schools are shut down. We're not, we're not consuming as much milk. So if you shut the restaurants, you shut the schools down, everybody's at home. They're buying cheaper cutlets too. Uh, I think there was a difference in about 75 cents a pound in a ribeye steak from February to March, and that's at the grocery store. And that's just people are looking at it saying, hey, I may get laid off or I am laid off or the market's going down. So I'll, I'll spend my money on ground beef and, and not as much on ribeyes and fillets, and I'll, I'll take my cuts down a level. And then you'll also see too prepared foods, which the beef industry's kind of gotten into that now. You know, we get pre-prepared fajita meats and things of that sort that they can take in a sack. The consumers gotten back to cooking, so they're going to buy cheaper meats. They're going to buy cheaper cuts. Um, it's it's going to be an interesting twelve months because we're just kind of getting the cusp on the export to be able to export some of this stuff out. When we were in that battle with 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 China and several. Japan had, you know, had backed off of, of importing our beef and stuff. And so, you know, it's going to be interesting to see. But in my opinion, I think you're going to see a pretty declining, uh, declining price in the next six months. And then it may stabilize for a while. Of course, an opinion is exactly what an opinion is. Uh, it, it's worth about 10 cents. But uh, if you look at the, mar the market statistics as we are now and you look at the demand, even on the poultry and, and pork guys, they pull production back as well. Um, so we're seeing placements lower. It's going to be interesting. I, I, I'm, if, if I'm a beef producer currently today, I would definitely keep things tight. Uh, if you're, if you're overstocked, I would understock. I would get rid of stuff that you don't want to feed. Uh, I'd get my deal as efficient as possible. If you need a new tractor, you might wait till next year. If you need, you know, if, bare necessities are kind of one of those times where in, in, in the cattle market has not been terrible. It hasn't been great. But it uh, it hasn't been terrible. The the corn and soybean guys have struggled for several years now. Five years in a row, we've been in the three and four dollar range on corn, and it's just hard to make a nickel. Um, it, you know, fertilizer is going to go down a little bit. Uh, you know, some of our expenses that we see, a pickup still costs sixty grand, and a tractor's a hundred. You know, I mean, that's just what the ranch guys deal with. So, uh, in my opinion, it's it's going to be it's going to be Pretty, margins are going to be extremely, extremely thin. Yeah, gotcha. 
Hey, and, you know, uh, one other uh, brief question is, uh, you know, you've seen the, the the stuff in the news lately between the meat pack the meat packers and the the cattle producers and the price difference there. Have you been hearing any of that amongst your ranchers and and, the, and your clients or any input on that? That, in my opinion, that has that has been going on for twenty five as long as I've been alive. There's been an argument about that. Here's the deal: eighty percent of the eighty percent of the of the production is controlled by four companies. And the reason it's controlled by four companies is vertical integration. They're not ever going to fight it. Um, there's some outside uh, foreign money that's come into some of these feed yards out in the panhandle of Texas and, and Kansas and stuff that have bought these feed yards and they're operating them and they're doing a pretty good job. But uh, to not have the plant and the, and the, uh, you know, the packer needs to, to own the feed yard. And then they're, in my opinion, I think the way to bridge that gap eventually is going to, they're going to have to get competitive like the chicken and pork companies have. They're going to have to figure out some kind of scale that they can uh, do a, a uh, contract basis on with these growers. Cause there's, the cattle business is still, uh, you know, it's the wild west. Everybody's got their own breed, their own type of deal, their own, you know, and it's, it's very, it's a whole lot different from from my country up to Kyle's and, and a whole lot different if you go out to Matt's country where they're running cattle. Everybody's running a different breed and a different set of, you know, cows and bulls and what they're wanting to do and how they do it. And I think, I think in my opinion, for them to be competitive and to keep Tyson and JBS and Cargill and those guys that are, that are controlling the market, they're going to have to, everybody's going to have to sit down at the table one of these days. I, I don't see it foresee it happening anytime soon, but uh, the competition's there. Right. Okay. Uh, now just kind of tying all that back into to land and how it's affecting the land market. What, what does supply and demand look like on production, uh, production grass ranches right now? It, you know, it, just in our little market here, uh, within a hundred mile radius of here, we've got several grass listings that are actually, we've had probably more activity in the last 30 days. And, you know, it's people are buying grass ranches because they already have something else paid off or it's an investment side. They're running cattle for the for the tax exemption as well as as a secondary business for, you know, maybe in the oil business on one side and then you're going to be in the cattle business on the other. Uh, there hasn't been an acre of grass probably in the United States that a cattle's paid for in probably 15 years, maybe longer. And uh, uh, you know, it's it's going to cause uh, it's going to cause some price uh, reflection. I think I think the stuff that's less, uh, you know, maybe speculative down the road that could possibly be cut up in smaller lots and sold for home places or or even development. I think those places are probably safe. If it's a true cattle grass ranch and there's no development in place or big metropolitan area within the 40 mile radius of the thing i think that it's it's probably going to see a pretty good correction all right well thank you clayton we appreciate that any other uh thoughts or or comments you might want to add that's been on your mind things you might uh think people would like interest, to hear interest is sure cheap right now i'm just saying <laughs> right money's cheap <laughs> yeah that's what everybody's been seeing a lot of right so Absolutely. okay well, clayton, we appreciate you, man. Uh, thanks Thank for, you, for being a part of it. And, uh, yes, sir. Uh, hope you stay safe out there and uh, hope it dries out a little bit. I hope that rain comes back. All right, next, we're going to move on to our next panelist, Kyle Han Hansen. We are excited to have him. He is our National Realtor Land Institute president, and he's an accredited land consultant in Nevada, Iowa. Uh, thanks, Kyle, for coming on. Uh, you're with Hertz Real Estate Services. And you're going to talk to us a little bit about agricultural tillable farmland. Uh, thanks for coming, Kyle. Thank you, Eric. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to visit with you what's happened here in the Midwest and be part of this uh, excellent panel of accredited land consultants from across the U.S. All right, thanks. You know, we, we like to say we're the voice of land and having all, uh, all of you guys here, uh, experts in your fields, uh, we appreciate it a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, We'll just go ahead and uh, I'll go ahead and ask you a few questions. Uh, how have uh, mid, the Midwest and agricultural crop land prices been affected uh, since this outbreak, since COVID-19? Well, we've done a lot 
there's been a, a little bit of activity, uh, some being removing properties from the market. We have uh, typically live auctions, in-person auctions for a lot of the tillable land, especially the high quality tillable land. Uh, in those markets uh, right now, we've actually been postponing a lot of those live auctions. There's still some companies that have switched to online auctions. Um, in fact, we're looking at uh, the possibility of doing online auctions uh, as well uh, from our company, just as a tool to continue to sell high quality pieces. The sales that we have seen, um, you know, we haven't seen much of a, a drop off and we kind of made the comment early on that it's still a little too early to tell how much this is going to affect the market. But I can, I can definitely tell you that there's been a lot of activity, a lot of phone calls asking what's available on the market. We still have several buyers calling to find out what good deals are out there, what uh, mixed use properties, whether it's with some recreational with some uh, quality tillable uh, productive ground. Um, it seems like there's money to be spent. And so there's a, I've even had a few properties that have been on the market for, you know, 10 months to almost a year that I received three offers on in two days on the same piece and didn't have hardly any offers over the previous 10 months. So there's a, there is definitely activity, I would say high quality. We're still seeing that market steady, medium and lower quality. It, it still takes a unique buyer for those. And we, we've seen those markets uh, a little bit softer over the past six months but we haven't seen it uh, drop off any in the last 30 to 45 days either with uh, COVID-19. So right now things uh, I would say are steady on high quality, uh, productive tillable land here in the Midwest. Um, obviously there's going to be some areas that uh, aren't as strong, uh, you know, based on uh, the buyers in the area. Okay, great. That sounds awesome. I mean, uh... Sounds good to hear that people are still looking at tillable ground and consider it as a safe investment and, and looking to uh, make purchases that way. Uh, what, what have you seen in the Midwest regarding uh, agricultural cropland, the market activity uh, since mid-March? I know you spoke a little bit about that, but, you know, dive in a little deeper in terms of, uh, you know, since really this became a, a real major thing that was, things started shutting down. Are you guys doing a lot more virtual showings? Uh, I mean, you talked about some auctions. Can you just kind of elaborate a little bit on how you guys are still doing business? Yeah, we're still doing a lot of remote business, um, a lot of teleconferences, obviously. Um, there's still, you know, a lot of our activity is all by phone uh, anyway, as we've got investors and farmers are out here that it's pretty much phone calls and your contacts. Um, you know, so a face-to-face -face meeting uh, isn't necessarily, um, you know, warranted. I mean, we can do business. We've always been able to do business somewhat remotely. Um, you know, we are utilizing drones. Obviously, everybody's uh, using drones a lot more, and we can see a lot more uh, views on our drone footage than what we've had in the past because people want to really get over the top of a property. They may not be able to physically go to it right now, so we're seeing a lot more activity uh, on those drone fit, uh, footage. So that's, that's a, a tool that's come out in the last few years that is now getting, you know, really popular and a lot of people are really viewing it. So I think those avenues, but yeah, from a, again, from the live auctions, a lot of those have been postponed just to a better time. Uh, you hate to see a client put a high quality piece out there uh, in the midst of an unknown um, situation, considering that the majority of our sales. I mean, if you get over 80 acres, you're selling a basically a million dollar property anymore in the Midwest, it seems like, um, especially if it's high quality tillable. So you really just need to be conscious of what's happening in each location. Um, volume wise, this is also a slower time of year for properties coming to the market, primarily because of the planting season. Um, woke up this morning and there's snow on the ground, uh, two inches. We didn't have snow on Christmas, but we do on April 15th. So go figure. Right. You know, well, uh, there's a lot of things that are happening and it's just a slower period. So I hate, hate to say if there was a time uh, for this to happen in the 
in the Midwest, this was about the best time because there's not a whole lot that comes to the market, but I believe there's going to be some pent up demand uh, moving forward. Great. Yeah. Yeah. I know uh, here, here in Oklahoma, we definitely have uh, a lot of sellers and, and buyers too asking for advice or asking about the market. Uh, what advice are you giving individuals that are inquiring about uh, selling or buying farmland during this time period? Well, if I'm visiting with a seller, you know, it's always now the right time to list and it is now the right time to sell a property. And my response is, it's the right time when you and your family decide that you're ready to sell a farm. Because if I was to tell someone, you know what, I don't know if now's the right time to do it. I think maybe six months from now is the right time. Um, I don't know what's going to happen to the market six months from now. I'm adding risk to their decision process and what may or may not happen. So if now's the right time, as long as they are realistic and understand the market conditions right now, um, I tell them what we've got buyers asking. And so, um, you know, just before the phone call uh, today, I did have someone that said, you know what, draw up the paper, paperwork, let's get this uh, ready to go. Let's move forward with putting this property on the market. And kind of that whole pent up demand that we believe we might be seeing uh, coming down the pipeline is that you have to be positioned to have your property available on the market whenever all this gets figured out. There's people that have deadlines to purchase 1031 exchanges it's great that they had their deadline extended until July 15th. Uh, but even then, if, uh, you know, May 1st comes, July 15th, too far Kyle, off. Kyle, thanks for being a part of and and, and giving us your thoughts there uh, on crap, cropland there in the Midwest. Uh, do you have any other comments or thoughts you'd like to add? You know, I just try to remind people, just understand the market, visit with your land professionals to know what's happening each and every day. Um, and from an agent standpoint, reach out to your sellers, your buyers to visit with them. So yeah, give us a call. More than happy to visit with individual circumstances. Great. Okay. Well, Kyle, we really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Uh, uh, I know everybody is, is still utilizing this virtual format and, and making their phone calls and talking to people, but uh, I appreciate you taking the time to join in with us. Uh, we're going to move on and talk about Timberland, uh, and uh, we've got Chris Miller, an accredited land consultant out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, he's with American Forest Management Incorporated, and uh, thank you so much for joining in with us and taking your time to talk a little bit about Timberland. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to be on the panel and uh, share what I know about Timberland and hear everybody else's perspective in their areas of expertise. Well, man, I appreciate it, Chris. Uh, Thanks a lot. So, uh, so far, you know, how has the COVID-19 outbreak affected uh, domestic forest product markets? Well, I think it's important before we talk about what's changed over the last month to kind of reflect on where we are, we were, and part of that is maybe me clinging into those early February conditions, but we were in a period of extreme optimism in the forest products market with really good conditions um, and a strong outlook uh, going forward. Much of the domestic forest products market is tied to housing, especially softwood, soft timber markets. And our housing market had been at about 1.6 million starts early in the year. And it was expected that was gonna be su sustained for the foreseeable future. So our long awaited housing boom had finally arrived and it appeared it was here to stay. Um, our hardwood producers were optimistic. They were having strong pricing uh, domestically and the trade uh, situation with China had improved greatly, uh, similar to the way it had improved for the farmers, uh, soybean farmers. So, um, and then pulpwood demand was good as well. So um, conditions were really good um, going into the, into the COVID outbreak. Um, starting in early March, um, as the widespread impact of this became more apparent, we have seen some softening in our forest products markets. Um, my normal work area is North and South Carolina. My company operates in 18 states and across the country, and we've seen this softening across our geographic footprint. Um, thankfully, the forest products market uh, were designated a critical infrastructure by the Department of Homeland Security. So the entire supply chain has been able to continue to keep working 
that's really good news for those of us that have had a hard time locating a pack of toilet paper um, in the last few weeks. Um, but the mills are lowering their inventories uh, in uh, preparation for what they perceive as a slowdown in demand for their products. Uh, these curtailments are under affecting the underlying value of the stumpage and our ability to deliver wood to their mills. Um, it's really early, but um, the price reductions have been fairly modest so far in forest products, but we do anticipate probably an eight to 12% uh, decrease in, in unit pricing across forest product markets uh, in 2020 with the salt timber markets probably at the upper end of that range just to, due to its close tie to housing. Um, the housing start estimate has been revised from about 1.6 million units down to probably less than a million anticipated for 2020. So um, a pretty quick and significant uh, expected downturn. Now that's the bad news. Uh, there's uh, optimism this is gonna be really short um, and probably a V-shaped recovery for our business. Um, we anticipate some further declines that have already started in product pricing through the middle of the year with some gradual increases starting in the fall of 2020 um, and through the end of the year. So our hope is, our expectation is that we could potentially be back to where we were in February 2020 by first quarter of 2021. Um, and the, part of the reason for that is the underlying fundamentals for forest products are so strong. Um, we have underbuilt homes in our country for over a decade. Um, the age of our homes is at an all-time high. About 42 years old is the average age of a home in the United States. So these homes are going to need to be replaced or repaired, renovated uh, very soon. And single family homes and renovations utilize the most lumber. Um, Secondly is our population demographics. You know, the, the, the biggest portion of our population right now is in their late twenties. Uh, most folks buy their first home around age 32. So a big sw uh, swath of our population is moving into that age where they're gonna be seeking to purchase those first time homes. So all of that we think points to a robust future um, if we can just get this COVID behind us. Um, just kind of ride it out a little and. So yeah. things are looking very optimistic. That's good to hear in the uh, in the timber market and as far as domestic forest products. And uh, thanks for that yeah. information. Now, yeah, you know. I mean, I I just add, you know, one of the main benefits of timber is that you can delay a harvest. So the the trees can't move off, they can't move out like a tenant can, and they don't expire. So uh, the owners can just uh, choose to defer the harvest until the conditions improve. Gotcha. Okay. Well, uh, so with that said, you know, uh, how are you seeing uh, the COVID-19 outbreak affecting the, the investment side of Timberland? And what is the expectation of this uh, and how it will impact on Timberland values and deal flow? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And we've been having some conversations uh, with our clients and our customers recently in the the broad uh, consensus is, is we expect uh, little impact on Timberland values. Uh, Timberland in investors in general have a really long-term view. Uh, most of their acquisitions are based on 10-year or longer ownership periods. So they expect and anticipate short-term downturns like we're experiencing now. Um, and, and that's going to have a you know, minimal uh, impact on the, on the long-term value of their assets. Um, in past recessions, I worked through 2008, 2009, we actually saw increased demand during that time. Uh, whenever there's a severe drop like this in equities, I think it reminds folks of the, uh, uh, the value of timberland in a balanced portfolio or farmland. Um, so, the, you know, usually these kind of things are, are good for us. They, they bring more focus to timberland. Um, I'm not an economist, but all this government stimulus that's being pumped into the economy, historically that has uh, caused inflation. And uh, Timberland is widely viewed to be a, a, a good hedge against inflation. That could make Timberland a more favorable asset going forward. Um, so we, we just really don't expect a lot of change in the deal flow going forward. Um, some folks may delay some deals short term, not because of price, changes, but just because of the ability to get due diligence done and to get deals closed. So um, short term. Right. 
Okay, awesome. So kind of in short, you're just seeing it taking a little longer for deals, uh, just the nature of how we're having to do business and people adjusting to how to do that, you know, how to still accomplish deals. Yeah, on the, on the large dispositions, you know, the, you still can't get hotels. It's not considered safe to travel by air really yet. And uh, all the folks that are needed to do due diligence and closings are, are not working at full capacity. So it's probably going to cause some delays. Right. And, you know, on, from our side on deals that we put recently under contract, I think, you know, as long as you're setting that expectation that everybody's still working really hard, we're all staying fluid and, you know, we're staying innovative to get things moving along. But, you know, it's just kind of expect things to take a little longer. And, but we're, we're all still working hard to get us all to the closing table, ultimately. And, and uh, we'll definitely stay, uh, you know, over the top communication at all times. But um, that we haven't really, you know, no one's really necessarily had a problem with that on our side. But um, I think it's good to give people that expectation up front. It just kind of helps things, you know. And then when 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 the, when if you finish early, everybody's happy, you know. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, Chris, man, thank you so much for for taking your time out. Any, you know, just any thoughts that you'd like to give? Any kind of uh, you know, positive things that you've seen here lately? Well, I can echo some of Kyle's comments. Call volume is at, uh, is much higher than it was pre COVID. So I, uh, I think the interest is there without question. Um, Great. Okay. Well, Chris, we really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week and thanks for joining on. We're going to move to our next panelists and discuss a little bit about recreational land. And uh, Justin, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining in. We have Justin Osborne, he's an accredited land consultant. Uh, he's out of Durango, Colorado, and uh, he's actually our future leaders chair, so thanks for, for being here. Uh, he's with the Wells Group Real Estate Brokerage in Durango, Colorado. Justin, thanks for joining with us. Yeah, thank you for having me on. Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, you know, what are you seeing and, and have you seen really any type of change in the demand for recreational land uh, due to the COVID-19 outbreak? Well, I've definitely seen an uptick in the demand for recreational land since this whole thing started a few weeks ago. Uh, kind of like exactly what Kyle was saying. I had some properties, three of them to be exact, uh, that had been on the market for over a year and all of them went under contract the third week of March all of them were recreational properties. They were vacant land. They bordered public land. It was kind of shocking that after being on the market for over 12 months, uh, we put them under contract to buyers that were just looking for places to get away. You know, the sports clubs have shut down. Uh, the rec centers have shut down. People just cannot get out and get exercise and spend time as a family. Uh, recreating like they were able to before all this started. And so it's been really interesting, you know, when you look at kind of the recession we had in 2007 and beyond 2008, uh, land took a big dip. And I would not have expected this, but it's been interesting to see that the demand for recreational land has actually gone up uh, since this COVID-19 virus came into effect and the stay at home order specifically came into effect. Yeah, you know, I mean, just in, in driving around Oklahoma, seeing uh, a lot more people outside uh, utilizing, you know, kind of rec in recreation, if you will. So, so you're, you're seeing an actual uptick because of that. Uh, people are starting to get outside more and try to find avenues to, to, you know, maybe buy their own little piece of land to, you know, have fun and enjoy the great outdoors. Yeah, definitely. And all of those were, you know, relatively small compared to the, the big tracts of land that most of you guys are selling. You know, the biggest one of those three was 160 acres. So we're not, we're not seeing the big ranches sell. We've still got a huge supply of that across the Rocky Mountains. Uh, but the, the smaller parcels that, that the average Joe can afford, uh, they're buying them. They're getting out there with their families. They're saying, we want a place where we can take a camper. We can get away. We, we can fill the freezer when it's hunting season instead of going and buying the groceries, you know, just like Clayton was talking about, uh, people are trying to find ways to get those cheaper cuts. And uh, what cheaper way than, you know, a single bullet from a 300 win mag come hunting season. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, awesome. Uh, Justin, what do you think uh, will happen? I mean, I know it's, it's speculative at this time, but you know, just kind of maybe your gut what's going to happen to the values of recreational land in the near future. 
Yeah, it's it's definitely too early to tell, but my opinion, just based on what I've seen the, the first four weeks this has been in place, is that we'll we'll probably see a small uptick. You know, I'm I'm thinking less than five percent, but probably somewhere in the the three percent range, uh, an uptick in the smaller parcels, especially those that that border national forest or BLM or state parks. Um, anything that's going to be small and relatively affordable for the average person to purchase. Um, I just, I don't see those depreciating with the demand that I'm seeing right now. Um, I think the, the bigger parcels, especially the, the seven digits, you know, you start getting million dollars and up. There's still a lot of inventory across the Rocky Mountains, uh, specifically where I'm at in Colorado and New Mexico. Uh, there's a lot of inventory and, while we are starting to see the land bankers, uh, Kyle kind of hit on, there's a lot of people with cash right now and they're looking for places to park it. Um, a lot of these ranches, they're, they're still, you know, high holding costs. Yeah, unless they're in ag taxes, uh, you got a lot of maintenance out here in the West. And so um, I, don't, I don't see those larger ranches doing quite as well. I think that we're actually gonna see more of a depreciation in those, especially the ones that are overbuilt uh, the ones with the 5,000 to 10,000 square foot lodges and big barns and riding arenas, uh, those are going to be hit pretty hard, I'm afraid. Do you, do you see that being a long term or, or uh, just kind of a, a, a in the immediate future, that being something that affects those larger kind of more luxury ranches? Yeah, I think it's going to be hopefully short term, you know, more immediate future, I think. In, in the long term, you know, things will, things will cycle back around like they always do and that demand will come back. But I, I think they're gonna get hit pretty hard here in the short term. Okay, all right. Well, Justin, uh, as our fearless leader, do you have any, uh, anything that you would like to add or, or anything else that, uh, you know, just you think would be good to share with, with everyone? Well, I think that there's, there's gonna be opportunities there. There's gonna be opportunities for uh, for clients, for investors, um, there's going to be opportunities even even for the average Joe. You know, when you look at uh, across the board, the amount of uh, recreational vehicles and toys that are that are financed, that are on credit, uh, that stuff's going to start getting pretty cheap and it's going to start getting pretty affordable. So anybody that's uh, needing a new side by side, I, I totally agree with what Clayton was saying. You're your, your farmers don't need to go buy that sixty dollars or $80,000 diesel pickup truck right now or that hundred dollars to $200,000 tractor. But if you've got some clients that are saying, look, we want to we wanna go get a 10-acre parcel up in the mountains. We want to get a, a camper or a toy hauler or a side-by-side. -side. What do you think is the best time to do it? I think all those things, uh, those campers and side-by-sides are going to get really cheap here in about six months. But I'm, I'm just totally speculating that. Maybe boats too. Uh, boats, definitely. Yeah, all you guys in Oklahoma and out in the Midwest where there's those lakes for, you know, good bass fishing and walleye fishing. Yeah, those boats are going to get cheap. Oh, yeah. You know, it was it was, it was interesting to see the, the rules and, and things they put in place at the local boat ramps uh, about, you know, only two people in a boat uh, is some of the things that we've seen at our local lakes. Uh, you'll be sighted if you're caught on the lake with more than one person in your boat, so two people per per vessel, uh, keeping distance at boat ramps, um, you know, things of that nature, uh, definitely. But uh, supposedly, and I, I actually saw it driving by Lake Eufaula, I mean, a lot of people on the lake uh, during this time. I mean, you can just see people. I mean, it's a beautiful time of the year. And, you know, and that's one thing I actually sat and talked with my wife. I was like, you know, it's good that it happens in the, in the most optimistic time of the year. And when I say it, I mean, you know, this COVID deal, because it's just the beauty, beauty of spring unfolding just has a way to uplift your spirits. And so, you know, having this in the midst of spring, at least we can go outside and it's gorgeous and everything's, you know, coming up and becoming to be green and we're seeing a rebirth in front of us. And I think everyone's optimistic that we'll see the same thing out of our economy and, and, uh, and, and, and also, you know, just our, our public health too. So Justin, thanks for, for jumping on with us and, we're going to move on to our next panelist. Uh, we've got uh, a, we've got Lisa Johnson and Drew Airy. Uh, we have two panelists on this particular topic, and I'm going to ask both questions to both of them uh, and let them go uh, give us uh, their input. We've got them kind of one in Oklahoma and one in Oregon. 
and we're going to be discussing rural residential hobby farmland. And uh, Lisa Johnson is an accredited land consultant with Horsepower Real Estate in Junction City, Oregon. And uh, Lisa, thanks for coming on uh, with us. We appreciate having you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I think this is a really good call with some great information. I've learned a lot, taken a lot of notes. I appreciate you guys very much. Um, just happy to be here. Yeah, okay, great. Hey, you know, here in the, in the last few years, we've really seen, you know, a surge in, in popularity amongst the, the rural residential hobby farm kind of ranchette type homes. Uh, why have, has these properties become so popular and, and how do you think COVID-19 and, and this outbreak will affect that current trend? Well, I think that we're kind of the entry level for land, if we want to put it that way. Um, we, Drew and I kind of focused on the five to 50 acre range, what's going on in that sector of the industry. And it's been pretty active actually. Um, people are wanting to get back to basics a little bit, even before this hits. I've seen just the increase in people from the suburbs saying, you got to get us out of town. Our kids are playing too many video games. We got to get them out in the dirt, want to grow their own food and just have a little space. And uh, it's also, it's kind of an easy transition, at least here in the, in the Western Oregon area. The price range for these five to 10, 20 acre properties is um, pretty well within reach for people to sell a nicer home in town and roll their equity. We've been gaining a lot of equity here in the last several years. Roll that equity over into a down payment for five, 10, 20 acres. And uh, they don't have a real big increase with the interest rates right now. They don't have a real big increase in their mortgage payment. And so just a lot of back to basics. And I think it's, I think it's a good wave. I love getting kids out, back out in the dirt. As far as going forward, um, what we've seen here is still a lot of activity in this range. Not a lot of listings coming on. Um, most of the counties in our area and also talking to some brokers up in Washington and Northern California, um, the sales, the closed sales were still pretty even in March that they are March of 2020 that they were in 2019. Um, we're seeing a little slip in the month of April, obviously, um, but pending sales are still happening. I think we've got an inventory shortage. Uh, we were short on inventory. I didn't know if we could get lower than one month of inventory, but we figured out a way to do it. And uh, so there's probably going to be a lot of demand. Um, still a lot of people calling from the metro areas, whether it's um, Seattle, or Portland or San Francisco, all across the board. That was the same answer with the brokers that I've talked to over the last week is um, people that were considering making a move have decided they'll make a move just as soon as they can. And um, whether it's to five acres or a hundred acres, they just want somewhere to go, somewhere to be. And also I think it's become a, a reality that not everybody's gonna have to go, go to work at an office. We've been working remotely horsepower real estate since 2008. There has not been an office somewhere in a town. So it's definitely doable. And uh, there'll probably be more people working remotely. So that's gonna allow for them to live a little farther out of these big metropolitan areas. I think it's, it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be kind of exciting to watch. Also think the economy is gonna come back pretty strong and, um, it, but it'll be an interesting next several months for sure. Okay, thank you for that. Now we also have Drew Airy, uh, an accredited land consultant uh, with Airy Land Co. KW Advantage Land. Uh, he's out of Coweta, Oklahoma. Drew, what uh, what can you talk to, or tell us a little bit about uh, rural residential and hobby farms in, here in Oklahoma and in your area? And uh, tell us a little bit about what you've seen and how it's become popular over the last few years, and and how this uh, the COVID nineteen is affecting that trend in your in your eyes. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, you know, what we see is ever since the farm to table, uh, you know, kind of got more and more popular, it seemed like more people wanted to get out to be able to raise their own chickens, you know, have their own, maybe a cow or two, have a horse. Uh, seems like ever since that, you know, we've, we've seen an increase in anything outside of 45 or within 45 minutes of a major metropolitan area. So, you know, our 
you know, kind of our stance on it and what we've seen is there's there's a lot of uncertainty in the market. And, and so I think we saw a little bit, or I know we saw a little bit of a stall in the phone calls coming in, but it seemed like the people that were calling were very interested trying to take advantage of either the situation or interest rates or whatever it was. And, uh, you know, we've had more and more calls. We've kind of like Justin, you know, we've had some seasoned listings on the market, so to say, and uh, many of them have been snatched up lately. You know, we've had a lot of calls on our, you know, rural residential developments where we may take an 80. We have a couple of clients we work with that we stay outside the subdivision regulations, outside of zoning and engineering, and uh, use road, road frontage to split up properties in kind of rural areas within 45 minutes of, you know, Tulsa's where I'm at, you know. So anything within 45 minutes of Tulsa seems to really, really hold its value. Um, and I know I've talked to a few on the East Coast and uh, in some of the northern states, and it's kind of the same thing. You know, the closer, if you're within, it kind of seems like the magic number of 45 minutes, if you can get to an area where there's a, you know, a population base where there's jobs, it seems like that land really, really holds its value strong. Uh, so we've continued to see that. We haven't seen that lift up too much. Um, you know, the inventory is low, and uh, I think is kind of, we've heard, um, you know, any time that we have a stock market crash historically, the feds try to boost the economy by lowering interest rates. And, uh, you know, I think we're, we're seeing people take advantage of that. And so it's kind of the perfect storm for real estate and even a better opportunity for those wanting to get out of town. Cause I couldn't be, imagine being stuck in LA or San Diego right now or Dallas for that matter. You know, all of those people it's running through their mind, man, I wish I had an acre, two acres, five acres, 10 acres, you know, I would love to have some room to breathe, especially during this time to see my kids run out in the yard and, uh, you know, have my own garden and not have to go to the store for certain things. So we've seen a, um, you know, incredible increase in, uh, or I think we'll continue to see an incredible increase in those, uh, those properties within 45 minutes of a major metropolitan area. Right. I've even personally, you know, on the fringe, like you said that, you know, 30 minutes to an hour, 45 minutes. Uh, if it is a larger parcel, I'm getting a lot of phone calls about, you know, would the seller consider selling 20 or 10 or five acres, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just supporting a lot of what you're saying too, just in terms of if you have it in that right location and you're able to, to execute that type of plan, that might be the best way to help your seller in, in, in selling their property. Yeah, and one other thing about it too is banks like to loan you know, they, they really don't like to go over that 10, 20 acre threshold. You know, you start getting into different financing. So buyers can get into something with a little bit of acreage and still be in the, you know, low threes, low fours uh, on, on an interest rate and not, not have to put as much down, can get, you know, some uh, better financing options as well on those smaller properties. Once you get into, you know, 40, 50 plus acres, you, you know, it's time to go to an ag lender. So... Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Lisa. Uh, you know, how are the markets looking, you know, for this segment, you know, the, the rural residential, I know you, you touched on it a little bit, uh, but how are those markets looking just currently? And then, and Drew also spoke a little bit about the future. Um, do you, do you see that this, uh, the, 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 the trend that we've had, but also do you see the future and, and maybe this idea of people wanting to get out further, or, you know, get a little, get a little elbow room, if you will. Do you see that being something in your area uh, as that growing as well? Yeah, it's definitely grown and, and um, something that's so important for, for consumers to know is that you really got to align yourself with a good lender that's on top of things that understands some um, rural property. Um, we use farm credit services a lot, even for they have a country home loan program here. And it's so helpful for to have a good lender that um, isn't going to surprise you somewhere down the road with some different requirement you didn't know about or mortgage insurance on 20% down. So it's just good to line yourself out with a good lender. And then also, um, as far as your realtor goes, really good idea to work with somebody that understands country property because if you're coming from in town going out of town you're going to need to learn about wells and septics and property line issues and the list goes on and on there's easements to deal with and um, lay of the land is it going to flood what kind of insurances are you going to need so just so important that 
I mean, RLI members make it a point to understand all of this stuff and just continue learning all the time. So consumer just need to be careful. Just be careful. Get a good team on your side. Lisa, that's, that's great information. Uh, Drew, I, I'll kind of, based off of what she was just saying there, uh, what advice would you give to individuals and clients that are possibly looking at leaving a more densely populated area out to more rural residential properties? And uh, what advice would you give those individuals? Well, I'd uh, go ahead and say, don't wait to buy land, buy land and wait. <laughs> Obviously not my saying. I didn't coin that phrase. Got to give credit where credit's due. Uh, no, but anyway, um, I think, you know, there's no better time. Interest rates are low. Things are affordable. Uh, a lot of construction lenders out there are trying to get, you know, people to come and borrow and build. So, you know, on these rural ranchette properties, I think that the, the opportunities are endless and there's a lot of property out there that's going to continue to be split and, uh, and divided and, uh, you know, made into rural subdivisions. And I think that there's a lot of opportunities for, um, you know, folks out there also to take advantage of that and, uh, you know, continue to maximize their land investments. And, uh, you know, if they you got to buy land, it all starts with buying land. So buy some land. That's my, that's my uh, like advice. That. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I uh, appreciate both y'all uh, coming and talking to us about uh, rural residential. You know, I do, I do hear a lot, you know, from, you know, uh, wiser people than myself, uh, more seasoned folks that in, in their evaluation of what's going on, they see a big push uh, to individuals moving, you know, maybe a little out of town or where they have a little more room, especially when we can utilize things like virtual offices. Everybody's learning how to work from home more. And I think a lot of people are going to look at, well, I can still own a place a little further out. And, and, you know, maybe if something else comes through that's, you know, similar to COVID-19 or maybe even, you know, hopefully, definitely, hopefully not worse, uh, I'll be in a safer environment, or at least that would be the perception to be a little further out of town. And so I do see uh, it is a, uh, a great opportunity for us as uh, Realtor, Realtors Land Institute members and those that are investing in knowing land to assist and help people uh, as they may be doing, making new purchases and looking at land for the first time, you know, so uh, I do appreciate all you guys that have put the time in and, and made this, uh, you know, something that you guys stay on top of and, and ahead of the game in terms of the knowledge about land. So thank you guys very much for that. We're going to, we're going to move over and ask, uh, you know, a few questions to the whole panel. So feel free to answer. Okay. So uh, questions for all our panelists here. Uh, Feel free to, to give us your input and how things are looking in your area, but are there still interested buyers in the marketplace and what does that look like right now? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I would just say that, uh, you know, there is buyer interest and I, I know that there's a lot of panelists that have already commented about their activity uh, in their own markets. And, you know, I, I think it's just a matter that people have an opportunity to uh, being isolated at home, they're, they're looking online. They're starting to take a look to see what is available out there, uh, more so than I think what they used to. You know, everyone gets busy in their day-to-day. -day, so I think the buyers are starting to look a little bit more actively because they just have some additional time right now to do so. Right. It's always fun to dream. So it's always fun to look at land. I know, I know before I could purchase land, I was on my phone or on the tablet looking at land every day until – Finally, I was able to pull the trigger. So uh, thanks for that, Kyle. Okay, next question. Uh, are there benefits to marketing a property right now while many states are inf enforcing stay-at-home orders? Anyone have any good thoughts about that? Yeah, Justin, go ahead, man. Yeah, just two days ago, uh, Seller and I had this exact same conversation, Eric, and, and what I told him was, you know, yes, we, we definitely need to honor and, and do honor uh, whatever the governors are recommending you do. Uh, that said, that there's buyers that, just like Kyle said, they're spending more time ever looking online. Uh, they need an excuse to get out of their house. And we put that property on the market this morning. I've gotten multiple emails already from potential buyers asking questions about that property. And what I told the seller was, yeah, there's probably less now than there was maybe six weeks ago, uh, but there's a zero chance they're going to find the property if it's not on the market. Let's put it on the market, see what happens. 
Uh, so glad that we had that conversation because I'm going to be shocked if that property is not under contract here within the next probably 10 days. Great, great. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're having similar dialogues as well. And uh, anyone else want to chime in on that question? Okay, Drew? Yeah, so uh, like I said, inventory supply is low and uh, there's nothing that can, uh, you know, overcome the, the great supply and dem demand. So we actually put a property on the market the other day, you know, kind of your normal home in town is actually Trisha's listing and it got multiple offers within, you know, six hours being on the market. So I think, uh, you know, one was... They accept full price? Yeah, accepted full price. So, I mean, you know, I think that, uh, you know, obviously we're talking more about just uh, just land, but as far as the market goes, you know, I do think that, uh, you know, it's still there, supply is low. If you have a product that's, uh, um, you know, halfway desirable, I think it's gonna get swooped up pretty quick. I mean, we're, uh, we also just listed two uh, smaller tracks over in Coweta, uh, put one under contract within three days and the other, uh, it's only on, been on the market 10 days and we've had several inquiries. So it's, uh, you know, I think that there's definitely still buyers out there and there's more people on Facebook and social media and looking at advertising sites than ever. So, yeah, I've got something to add to that. So go ahead. As far as the marketing goes, um, with technology the way it is today, we have an incredible ability to effectively market a property inside and out with little to no contact with the drone videos and the photography and 360 views and that sort of thing, people can get a really pretty good tour of a property without even being there. So that's been working really well to our advantage with the drone videos, like we mentioned before, but um, don't be afraid. We, we can come in, get something done, very little contact as far as marketing, setting up marketing, and it really will have a big impact with the inventory as low as it is. Yeah. You know, we, uh, we here at, uh, in Oklahoma and Airy Land Company, we, we've, you know, geared more towards the virtual showings as much as we can. Uh, like you said, embracing the technology, the, the, the interactive mapping that we can utilize. Uh, I actually conducted a full virtual showing uh, last week. Uh, I did it through a Zoom meeting and I walked them through the whole listing. It was neat because we had Google Street View, which is weird in rural Oklahoma to have Street View, but I could show them right where the driveway entrance was. I could show them the property boundary lines from an aerial and uh, pretty much got them set up to where, I mean, it's a, it's a raw vacant piece of land to where they felt comfortable to go out and look at it themselves. And, you know, I said I could be there, you know, FaceTime them or be a part of a phone call while they look. Um, but they were, you know, individuals that wanted to, to look at it without me there because of, of what's going on. But, you know, with technology and, and everything that we have at, at our disposal, we still can, still can definitely market and show property in, in an effective way. So. Okay, uh, I think, okay, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I was just going to add one more thing on the technology. Uh, similar, we we have geo-enabled PDF maps that we can email our potential customers and they can pull those up on their smartphones and there'll be a, you know, a blue dot that can help them navigate the properties by their cell. So that's one way we've tried to overcome personal showings is using uh, maps like that where cell coverage is available. Okay, th thank you, Matt. Uh, Next question uh, for the whole panel, what can landowners expect uh, that the land market will look like as we come out of this outbreak? Take that one. Um, I think we've got more liquidity coming into this recession than we've arguably ever had on the sidelines and ready to be deployed, more capital out there. And with this recession, I mean, we typical recessions are caused by an imbalance in supply or demand. This one was caused by regulatory action, shutting down both supply and demand immediately. So it's a really unique situation. And I, I think we're all optimistic it doesn't last very long so that the lasting damage isn't that great. But if, if, uh, if the regulatory action gets lifted, which we believe it will in the near term, then, then hopefully that spigot for both supply and demand opens right back up and, and we're able to get back to business. And as we've talked about, there's pent up demand there's more capital out there than there's ever been. There's cheap money. And land historically, as we've talked about, has been a great inflation hedge for tillable land and other types of land. There's secure cash flows. And, you know, it's, it's just a, a great hard asset. And, and I think people are starting to realize that, uh, you know, 2007, 2008, 2009 is unique. But the equities market can be volatile 
you know, five times during one economic cycle. And, uh, and land rarely sees that level of volatility. So I think we're going to see more and more people start to look at land uh, across the spectrum, all the different types of assets in land is a great place to place money. Okay, Kyle. I, I agree with Matt. I think there's going to be uh, the liquidity that's there is just uh, unbelievable. Um, you know, a lot of people look at pulling money out of the stock market to put into something solid and uh, have a solid asset. Uh, it's not very often that you get someone that talks or inquires about selling land to turn around and invest back into the stock market, uh, considering how much has changed. And I've received both those phone calls in the last 10 days. You know, one from a seller standpoint that thinks it's going to be a great time an opportunity to invest into the stock market once this squares away. And then the, likewise, someone that saw the market starting to go down and got out, and now they want to put their funds into something more of a solid asset uh, and take out the volatility of the stock market. So I, I, think, you, I think the sellers or the landowners uh, just need to be poised if they are considering selling, just be ready to pull the trigger and do what they need to now uh, to understand what's happening in the market. Yeah, thank you for that, Kyle. Okay, well, guys, uh, that that finalizes or ends our our panel and our questions. Uh, you know, thank you so much for joining in. I, I know it's great to rub elbows with with the leaders in our industries, and uh, thank you for that. Um, you know, thank you again to our panel of expert accredited land consultants for sharing their expertise today. Uh, to find a land expert in your market that can help you navigate these uncertain times. Uh, please visit rliland.com to access their Find a Land Consultant tool.